<clears throat> Words are capable of both sound and significance. Many people prefer song over speech in that the former can cover up the lack of the latter. Just as a man with large feet and small shoes can expect foot troubles, so too can a mind made of opinions expect to be trampled on. A kid called out to the world, sticky is as sticky does, I can't come off the porch and play, my foot still nailed to the past. And just then the web of his ancestors appeared at the door and scolded him for not mentioning them in his explanation. <laughs> and now though, for the free pair of socks, answer this question. Should the child be kind and respectful of his elder genetics or should he try and twist around somehow and cut them? One man had an ink pad and a stamp that would show the date. And at times when he was too tired to change the date of the stamp, he had just re-inked the pad. <laughs> oh yeah, before we go any further, here's a follow-up to that last item. Man's mind is like an ink pad, mm -hmm. but no one understands quite how. Now onto some news from the world of the armed forces. The sergeant barked to the troops, okay, have a headache if you got a head. <laughs> we don't have many veterans watching the show, do we? <laughs> one day a man said to life, since I've been a good boy, how about answering one really good intellectual type question for me? And life replied, all right, but you have to pantomime it for me. <laughs> the theme song of the city Condo Dwellers Association. Oh, you can live upstairs or you can live down, but you can't stay in both places at once. But come on, guys, you knew that. Hmm. A child asked the postman, I want to send a message to a mystic. How do I do so? And the letter carrier's dis depository of addresses went completely blank. In closed systems, with no knowledge thereof, communication is not possible. Original thinking was the secret model for all types of addiction to follow. The only way, a series of short essays. The only way you can the way men run the world is to be stupid enough to believe that they do. The only way you can find fault with your ancestors is to believe that they had none. The only way you can find fault with what you are is to accept it. Okay, there are two, there are two ways for this one. The only way you can find fault with what you are is to be stupid. And finally, the only way you can ever find fault with the way things are is to have no knowledge of how they started, where they're going, and what they're presently up to. As he walked the streets of the town, the man shouted aloud, take the glue from my mind and the starch from my shorts. And a woman in a second story window called down to him, which do you want first? And this so startled the chap that he vowed to ne'er come this way again. A story from the Middle Ages, or perhaps from one man's middle years. Not having an individual personality, the simple believe that they do. After being wonderfully wounded in a skirmish, a knight requested that the attending battlefield physician take, use the opportunity to remove his imaginary eye. <coughs> and now to make up for the last time, a real inspirational story. Instead of holding to any particular religious belief, this one man had a skin rash, and the housing authority notified him that he would have to have the normal auto inspection, same as everyone else, or else his ability to pursue a career would be stripped and re-lacquered with the next high tide. 
<coughs> Standing just outside the gates, a citizen raised his voice in urgent inquiry. If being sort of dazed and in a limited state of awareness is man's normal mental condition, then will not actual physical death be a step upward for most? And after saying this, he paused thoughtfully for a moment, <laughs> bit his lip, cut his eyes in the corner, and suddenly added, never mind answering, and ran like hell. Yeah. <laughs> Although tradition is upheld by ordinary minds as being a high-minded, meaningful, and nourishing part of human existence, they fail to note that a practice only becomes a tradition when all involved have forgotten its original intention and now just blindly follow it. <laughs> Anyone who simply believes that life is a jokester has overlooked the humor cloaked as irony, etc., that is a natural byproduct of 3D engines being propelled by 2D fuels. A fable. A man once found himself on a world of many animals and him, the only thinking creature, and having nothing better to do. And by the way, this is the one part of the story that is not fiction. Well, anyway, and having nothing better to do, he decided to try and teach some of them to think and speak. <laughs> the end. Well, what'd you expect? You know how it goes from there as well as I do. You could say that in a way, Fate bestows compensatory favor on the simple in that generally they're not particularly aware of their condition. What the hell that mean? <laughs> a man asked a guy with a funny grin on his face, will knowing the secret of life save you from death? No. Well, will it save you from life? No. Then what will it save you from? Mm -hmm. A uselessly distracted one. Mm -hmm. A uselessly disturbed one. <laughs> Sometimes I rewrite on the spot, folks. <laughs> then what will it save you from? A uselessly disturbed one. <laughs> Similar to the fact that, although you can't lengthen your life, you can shorten it is that while you can't really improve yourself, you can abandon the old darling. Mm -hmm. A man in a metaphorical daze pondered, if the left brain is simple and the right complex, then what is the bridge connecting the two? Mm -hmm. But his musing misses the mark, for it is the connection itself that is the potentially complex. The true liberation of the mind, as dreamt of in some mystical quarters, would be the freedom not to think of anything in particular. Nuclear physics and certain human behavior. Cults are formed when the irony surrounding a religion reaches critical mass. <laughs> I like the kind of wave things take here. Some nights, only jokes about drunken bricklayers in Mississippi trying to pick up waitresses get any reaction. And then the next time, it's items based on nuclear physics. Go figure. One man decided that a way to protect himself against getting all upset at the stupidity of others was simply not to listen to them. But he soon came to a surprising discovery of how difficult it was not to. That is, how much he wanted to. Last time I saw him, he was laying down with a cold compress across his head. <laughs> One world's secret motto. We're all born simple and will hopefully stay that way. And now, my editorial comment thereon. <clears throat> Such expressions of hope and belief are generationally limited. That is, while they can seem to have some basis in present needs, they are but dreams to help distract the ordinary from the forever dawn, always breaking, just at the edge of their perceived horizon. News from the fairgrounds. There are two possibilities if you know how to do it. You can swell up and burst, or swell up and blow away. 
Life awarded local reality the concession to guess your weight, and at the rate most people dumb themselves into the neural grave, you won't have long to wait. No. <laughs> Tis nigh impossible to get sheep interested in the music of eagles. The scene of would-be leaders appealing to men on the basis of their race, nationality, religion, or culture is an outstanding example of the simple being led by the even more simple. Optical alert. Criticism of the simple is creeping myopia, myopia for the potentially insightful. Alert alert. The mind is a planetarium and what you notice, the projector. The life of the true knight is not in the slaying of dragons, nor the righting of wrongs, but in the conquest of his own stomach, heart, and head, and in the beginning, not even that, but rather reaching a nose-to-nose -nose familiarity with them. What warrior worthy of the name goes out, seeking foes, when things inside his own castle threaten to do him in? That is, non-physically, figuratively speaking, through neglect and ignorance. You may know that the great mythical war warfare is properly underway within you when the wit, nay, yea, even the reality of, the moat separating you and there from the world out there begins shrinking to the point of impertinence if not non-existence. One man's eyes got so bad that he began to have headaches. Being an unexpected sort, he adds that he surely wishes he could somehow get the process turned the other way around. <laughs> the mind is to a liberated state of consciousness as the tracks are on the trip from Paris to Istanbul. No one wants to stay on them forever, but what are you going to do? What are you going to say within the confines of the written page. Second verse. Thought is to words as loosened awareness is to silence. Neo-silence, that is. How justice really works, or could. Just before he died, this one man passed out. He had a brother who executed this procedure the other way around. Men invented nuclear explosions to try and avoid having to think better. <laughs> there are two sources of metagnostic knowledge, those that don't exist and tell you something, and those that do and don't. One man says that he started out as a mystic and ended up being an overcoat for the poor. There are two kinds of simple, the simple simple and the transcendental. A man who had lived in the same house for a long time went to an unusual moving company and asked the owner how you might tell when your thinking has reached its profitable limits. And the mover replied, do you still engage in thinking? Yes, replied the man. Well, said the mover, there's your answer. A viewer submits, I have listened to you for some time now and have concluded that you may have one thing totally backwards, and that is that it may only be those more complex of mind who take life seriously. And as you people know by now, some viewers are less non-correct than others. And now a health tip from the world of non-traditional medicine. Thoughts won't kill you, but thinking them will. <laughs> a kid on a playground told a buddy, my old man finally told me what a mystic is. It's someone who can make themselves dizzy without having to spin around. A bit 
from last time. I was responding to a question having to do with kinds of seriousness, and I was drawing a distinction as per what we assumed was the intent of the questioner, and had laid out kinds of signs and points about the fact that there is a kind of seriousness that is non-standard and would have to do only with this sort of activity no matter what it would be called. And as everyone knows, or as everyone has heard from this platform many times, the notation of how this sort of activity is, for all intents and purposes, unnecessary unnecessary by any general view, unnecessary by any common description. Then, here we go, now I'm picking up tonight. This first part, I guess you ought to put in quotation, see, because I'm sort of doing an imitation of me up here doing me, <laughs> or the guy that's supposed to be me. You ready? All right, based upon that, uh, I was going to tonight also point out that being serious about such activity as this, is indeed an absolute, singular activity with a human because it requires an absolutely singular commitment. How else? If you're going to do something that's unnecessary and you become as serious about it as I, as I was trying to point out, and as many of you feel yourself that it's not really open to question anymore it's whether you're going to continue doing this. It's just a matter of how long you live and whether you can fight off arthritis or whatever it is, that you can always show up somewhere and sit or do something. But it's being involved, let us say, back to the question from last time, in a very serious way. But consider the kind of commitment, that's what I was going to say, the kind of damn commitment it takes, personal commitment on a man's part to be that serious in his whole life, more or less, focuses around something that is absolutely unnecessary. Does that take a, a singular, a kind of unique <laughs> kind of commitment? I mean, ordinary people can say, well, yes, I'm committed to being a good Catholic or a good Jew, or a, and you find out, or they should know, or the main reason they're committed, there are all sorts of reasons, combination of reasons, social pressure, it's expected of them, they're afraid of dying. They're sick. Every time they say that they're back to being a committed religious person, whatever it is, or a person that says, I'm trying to get somewhere in my career. And they say they're committed, but it's always, it has an obvious payoff. Or you say, well, why? And they will say, well, you know, you can say, well, why in the world would you be religious? Why in the world would you work two jobs? Why? And they have an answer. And they can say, yes, I'm committed. But now think about it. I'm not questioning it. But what kind of commitment? Well, let's call that one level of commitment. You're committed to something with, as far as you're concerned, a known payoff. You can answer the question. You ask somebody, why in the world are you doing whatever it is? And they go, well, I'll tell you. You sure do seem committed to your hobby, your job. Well, yes. Well, why? And there is some describable payoff that is reasonable sounding to ordinary people. But now if we take something, if we didn't tell him what tell the ordinary person what it was. We didn't put a name on it. We just said, uh, what would you think about if you met somebody that seemed by all appearances and by all other accounts to be quite sane and normal, and they had this strong commitment, but sort of the way you do your job or your religion, they go, all right. But they've got this real strong commitment. Now listen to me. They're sane. I don't find anything funny about them except this one thing's unusual. They go, all right. They are, they are equally committed, let's say to you. I'm just saying that. And the guy goes, okay. But there seems to be, they can't even tell you why. The, the activity, I won't tell you what the activity, but it's kind of a, an intellectual pursuit. And the guy goes, okay. But there seems to be no, they won't even admit. They won't proclaim that there is any known payoff. Now you surely know, an ordinary mind, if he made you repeat it several times, talk about it, he'd go, well, then you've got to be wrong because the person cannot be totally sane and ordinary. So, Going from that to what I'm saying that I started to come out and pick up from last time and say, remember I'm quoting, I'm doing me like I was me, like the guy normally doing me. So, <laughs> so we, we hadn't got to the real part yet, have we? Is that an inference that we ever have? <laughs> Don't get smart. Don't get smart. <laughs> that was me pretending to do 
Well, you, I think. I was going to come out and point out from last time that that kind of, quote, seriousness, the kind of commitment to this kind of activity is singular for no other reason in that it takes a commitment to something that seems to have no purpose. And so then we could say, by God, we're talking serious, serious now. I mean, it's one thing for ordinary people, even you in the past or at the ordinary level to say, yes, I'm serious about my job or I'm serious about getting a better health and better shape. Because there seems to be, or there, ordinary people wouldn't say seems. They would say there is a known payoff. By getting better health, I'll live longer. I'll feel better. I'll look better. I'll be more popular. All kinds of things. But you say, well, pursuing this sort of thing, if you became more conscious, if your awareness became much more complex to where you actually knew what was going on in life, what would be the payoff? How would that benefit you? Of course, I've already answered that, but not, not ever answering you, at least saying, you know, there is none. I'll give you the safest answer. In case I'm a little wrong or in case I'm shaving a little bit, it's on the good side. It's on the positive side. In other words, once you see it, uh, you won't feel like I cheated you or misled you. I just give you the easy answer that there really is none. So what if I had come out and done this whole thing and said it takes a singular Think about it. It takes a singular kind of seriousness to commit yourself to something that has no payoff, that has no describable, no known purpose, other than your imaginary purposes, which I have tried to disavow you of. I know everyone has read and imagined, well, if, if I ever reached that kind of enlightenment, boy, no telling what would happen. Well, yeah, there is some telling what would happen. I've already told you, but you think, oh, it would, you know, it's just... What a payoff. What a day it would be that you can just picture the Buddhas and everyone after all that work, after 40, 50 years and it happened, they went, boy, now, boy, it was worth it. He never said that. None of them ever said, boy, it was worth it. I, I, I went as far as any usable verbiage. I told you that none of them ever had it and then turned around and went, wait a minute, where do I get my money back? But they never turned around and went, wow, boy, that was worth it. Glad I stuck with it. They didn't have any damn choice. I mean, well, they're going to finally get enlightened and then start lying to themselves and you to go, boy, I'm glad I stuck with it. As opposed to what? Uh, so, all right, now hold that for a second. Now back to, since I know no one sees the point of it. <laughs> I mean the first part. That I was going to come out and say, based upon last time, in reference to last time, just think to sort of wrap up last time, just think, to pursue something that has no known purpose, how serious, in a singular way, how serious you must be. And that just sounds, or it should, unless I've wasted all this preface, I'll go ahead and speak for it. That sounds just pithy as all get out. <laughs> Deep, meaningful. But the fact is not. Let's try it again. Think about this kind of activity trying to pursue the mystical goal when it has no known anybody that knows has never said what the payoff they never told you so take mine I'm giving you better than the books that has no known payoff and that's the one thing in life that a, would be mystic that a person some people give seriousness to everything else is just in one level one class and then there's this and the rest is not serious to them. Only this is serious. But consider the kind of seriousness that it takes to be serious about something as opposed to everything else. That this one thing is the one thing in life that seems to have no purpose. The one thing. And here it is a group of people some way stumbled across it or heard about it and suddenly that's the one thing they're serious about is something that has no purpose. And they just turn their back on the rest of it. That is as far as taking it seriously. Think what kind of commitment, think what kind of seriousness that takes. And you think, yes, by God. <laughs> Except for the fact the whole idea is meaningless. <laughs> it's just that, I mean, it's no worse. Yeah, it is worse because it's clothed, apparently, in metagnostic, transcendental, higher level, spiritual, spooky clothing. But as resoundingly important as it may sound to one, and that I bet I could few people were a decent kind of audience, I could keep this up and have you all going, yeah, yeah, by God, 
and feel like, yeah, we're getting somewhere and be proud of what you've done thus far. Even if you feel like, even if you feel like you hadn't really done much or you hadn't gotten anywhere, you think at least I've stuck with it. <laughs> and it seems like some sort of really extraordinary commitment. I know it does. That's the reason I went through all this. But it's just as hollow as uh, one of those cheap Easter chocolate candy bars that won't, or one of those eggs that won't put the filling in. I mean, it's just meaningless. The kind of seriousness, the kind of extreme, unique commitment it takes to stay serious and to stick to something that seems to have no purpose. And if I go, yes, by God. Unless you not only think about that, but more than that, is begin to think about the workings of the mind. Begin to think about the limitations in a 3D engine being run off 2D fuel. Because about the time you think, well, I've changed brands and I no longer hear the thing knock. Knock. <laughs> and you have to look over this way. But you change brands and you quit going to the Buddhist station and you stop over at the uh, Islamic station. No. And for a while it seems like, boy, the things begin to purr. I may be getting somewhere. Knock. Now. Knock. What was that? <laughs> now. Along with, we'll apparently arbitrarily drop the subject right there of the, I'm going to come up with a synonym for limitations when I speak about the limitations of speech. What I was really considering was maybe carrot juice instead of limitations. But, well, I, I'm working on what I wanted to do for this mystical reasons of numerology is I want to get a synonym that has the same number of letters. <laughs> But at any rate, we'll pretend for a second that I've changed the subject, all right? <laughs> or as they seem to like to say nowadays, okay. <laughs> hmm? If it doesn't cost any more to be hip than to not be hip, why not? Okay? Okay. You can pretend I've changed the subject completely or not. I would like to read 95035, <laughs> item 11 tonight. Although tradition is upheld by ordinary people and ordinary thought as being a high-minded, meaningful, and nourishing part of human existence, <laughs> they fail to note that a practice only becomes a tradition when all involved have forgotten its original intention and I just blindly follow it. When you think about yourself, you and everyone else that you ever heard of, but just as normal. When you think about trying to do something extraordinary, trying to become enlightened, trying to figure out, trying to discover the secret, trying to awaken consciousness to another level, all of that. There are traditional methods to do it. And beyond that, this of a more limited, <clears throat> not carrot juice yet, but you know what I mean. If I say limited, you'll know I mean carrot juice <laughs> until I figure it out. Well, carrot juice, no, that's backwards. The, well, I've got one person already working on it. <laughs> the limited and arcane aspect of trying to do something extraordinary through, like this, through some, quote, traditional methods. Also, note that tradition out in the ordinary world, the world on which we all depend, the world out there which is the stomach to our, to a mystic's intellect, collectively speaking, is out there tradition is, is of great importance. It is the heart of man moving from the non-thinking level to the thinking platform. It is the movement to civilization, as I've been calling it in general. Tradition is an overall description, a fair description of everything from morality to custom social custom to the law itself. Whatever legislation any group of peoples under which they are apparently are civilly operating. But tradition would just a just pass the just a little past the mundane of saying, well it's tradition for us to uh, obey the law. That's really stretching it because just a little past the basic uh, connotation of tradition, it takes on another connotation that is much warmer, fuzzier, 
seems to be of greater depth and importance, and that is traditions all the way from what might appear to be a personal, an individual one, that you may have a tradition in your family, one side of your, your mother's side of the family. It's a tradition that uh, on your grandfather, your late grandfather's birthday, or on uh, Christmas, that everyone who is alive east of the Mississippi gets together on the Saturday before Christmas. And it's a tradition that they eat at 4 o'clock. And it's a tradition that everyone gives everyone else a present that they made. In other words, that kind of thing. And it, is a, it can be individual. But then when it gets to be a little larger and going past what would appear to be just, or what is, the real common traditions of simply that you get President's birthday off at work and they get banks closed down on certain holidays. The traditions that I'm trying to get you to consider is that men, ordinary men, and people with extraordinary demands, but even the ordinary men, I was inferring you people, would be mystic, but even in the ordinary world, taken just a little bit further, people with no hoochie-coochie, spooky, metaphysical leanings, hold tradition. All sane, civilized people hold some tradition somewhere in real esteem. And generally, the easy one, as always, to describe would be religious in nature. Uh, and it doesn't matter really how actively any particular person's participating in the religion. If they are civilized and grew up in a, well, if they're civilized, they're going to give some internal and a bit, perhaps even more of external, if asked, lip service. They will lend some credence, even if they would claim to disagree with some of the surrounding dogma to whatever it was, but they would give some real significance. They would consider that tradition, even a religious sort that they may not personally be involved with, holds some higher place. The kinds of tradition that people have toward, as I said, the religion is the easiest one to see, that you believe that some practice has something outside just mundane repetition. Yeah. Ordinary minds, civilized ordinary minds, find they believe tradition to be, just in general, to be of a higher level activity that tradition, assuming it's, it's something in their mainstream, to be of a higher level that it has some distinct potential nourishment that is not readily available. And yet, what is tradition? And I can pull out without even looking almost a literal definition, or you do it yourself, of what tradition is. But somewhere between that, or in combination between that, what I'm about to point out is the actual operation of it. In other words, tradition. And now we can go from the ordinary realm, if that seemed to be too bland, and go into areas that people have historically considered to be of great importance, of going somewhere to some school that once every 10 years or once every 50 years they go and they sit for two nights at, around the tomb of their founder of their particular mystical order and they dance until people pass out or they take, they pray for two weeks nonstop. Something that I am not making light of at all that they take to be of extreme significance. It is a they may even talk about it a lot. It all helps. I'm just trying to get you to picture whatever it is in your own mind that you've heard about or can imagine that you might assume would be a, or that you've thought when you heard about it, should be or could be a very meaningful tradition. <coughs> and I was just trying to give you a wide range there of just something happens every several decades or once every lifetime and takes weeks and these people go do it. And the part of you that is interested in things extraordinaire can hear that, and it has a quite definite appeal. Again, reminding you that's not limited to would-be mystics and people at the edge of society, society in general. The more civilized you are, in fact, the mind of such people, of ordinary people, will take tradition to be probably at least a bit superior to civil law. That it, is, that it comes from somewhere, even if they're not religious. They just know it springs somewhere from man's better desires, whereas the law, 
uh, obviously must be faithfully, unless you're going to pay the consequence, must be faithfully observed. You must live by the law. But that is based upon the fact, or based, is based on the reaction to the fact that man is still has a baser inclination. And so you can't really pay a great deal of some sort of spiritual homage to the law. There's one reason I might point out that they build such grand, as always, edifices to the law, because they're in big you know, statues and big things they translate into Latin about, you know, the beauty of the law and justice and all that, and that the law is, and you can make that argument, except you can look at one way, the law and all of its majesty and grand granite buildings is still an admission that man is still a very uncontrolled, beastly, potentially beastly animal. So you can look at these grand court buildings and look at them as an admission. It should be sort of shameful. I'm just trying to get you to see that's not as obvious as it looks. The people, even ordinary people, fairly sophisticated. In fact, the more sophisticated in the ordinary sense they are, the more likely they would be to agree, even if it was not religious, that tradition actually holds a higher place than the law itself. There may be education, maybe all sorts of ordinary, civilized endeavors and institutions and activities of progressive, liberal, educated men and women that they would still, those sorts of people, they might be humanist, not religious, but if you talk to them about tradition, in the full sense of the word, nice, ordinary, sane, sophisticated thinkers, people, would tend to place tradition as being an output somewhere of not man's baser instincts, as the law is a reaction to, but that tradition, at least not necessarily will make you that way, but it is some sort of reflection, it is some kind of projection of man's better potential. And that's what these traditions are. It's something to remind man that he is human. It's not like going to court every two weeks and have to pay off a traffic ticket. That's something to remind you or, or you know, they keep arresting you for uh, contempt of court because you won't pay your child support. Almost on schedule every month, your wife has to, your ex-wife has to call. And it's just a reminder of how uncivilized, how base you really are. Whereas a tradition a man, like I said, a sophisticated, ordinary person, without having any specific example in mind, would say, whereas the following of the kinds of traditions he would assume I'm referring to are actually a reflection of man's better potential. And this ordinary person would probably say, even if I do not uh, pursue, if I'm not a follower of the particular tradition, he would favor them. Traditions seem to bring out, or seem to be a reflection of a higher aspiration of men to remind men. Well, think about them. People who go and to visit a tomb of some religious founder or even a philosopher, some great painter or poet. Uh, but they seem to go there, and the point is they do it with reverence. They go to the tomb where they go and they, whatever the tradition is, they take a, one flower of some kind and they take it uh, to the village where he lived. And the point is they go there and they're supposedly considering the words of this teacher, this philosopher, uh, this poet. You understand? It's, it aspires. You do, people do not have a tradition of going and paying homage to uh, some dead tyrant, some madman. It's always, you know, boy, are we glad he, he's out of the way, even his followers. Once the, once the game's over and they uh, kill the head guy, they go, oh boy, I'm glad you guys got him. We've been trying our best to get away from him. <laughs> there, there is no tradition. There is no homage paid to maniacs, to yeah. destroyers etc., to the regressive. And so whoever the tradition is aimed toward, whether you can understand it, whether it's in a culture so far from yours, or that doesn't matter. You should understand what I'm saying, that tradition, in the widest possible sense of that word, all over the world, strikes the ordinary people, the sane, ordinary, intelligent people of the world, as being of a higher order. Whether they understand, whether they agree with it, they favor it. Because tradition is never destructive, and, it, but I'm, Getting to the point, believe it or where, there, not. It reflects, they assume, something to encourage, something to support, something to help move men in more thoughtful, more humane, but more thoughtful is what I'm going to get in a minute. That the traditions, as opposed to, say, the law, and the sanctions of the law is simply a reminder that you will be punished if you just blindly continue to act in animalistic, greedy ways. That you keep taking your neighbor's food. If you keep going over his garden and stealing his food, he can have you arrested. And we'll keep 
finding you until finally we'll put you in jail. We'll put you in jail longer and longer. You, you've got to learn not to do that. Whereas tradition, the mind would assume, would, the mind would say if asked, ordinary sane people, that tradition is not to simply punish man for his blind activities, for blindly following the kinds of crude, greedy hungers of the body that's native to all of us, but hell, we've got to get over it. And tradition seems to be almost the other side of that. Or at least beyond that, it's, it's a kind of higher level response to tradition of whatever nature. It's to remind man to do something more thoughtful, something more exemplary of a human. And stealing food, being a criminal is not exemplary of being a human. It may be common, but it's not exemplary. And every sane person knows that in all traditions. They take to be a reflection, to be some sort of activity, some sort of discipline, some sort of act that would help people remind people that they are more than simple blind animals, that they are more than their crude hungers, that they should be aspiring, that this is to help encourage them to higher levels of humanness. Whew. But, or but, We did change the word, subject from about words and the way the mind is trapped. Yeah, okay. But, after all of that, the mind still fails to see the shorthand, the main peanut in the shell of what tradition is. After all of that, which is true, or I wouldn't have made it, I wouldn't have repeated all of that. All of that's true. All of that is a fair detailing, and then some, of the place tradition holds, what it represents to sane minds, where they've given the word, and what little hints, nurgings I just did. But contrary to that, is here we go, the mind and two-dimensional fuel running three-dimensional engines. Contrary to all of that, traditions become traditions only by one way. That is, things that started out and things that people's minds, sane, hip people, sophisticated, civilized people will still say that tradition is to encourage one, is to remind one. Whatever the discipline is, whatever the particular ritual, the reason you go do it. And rather they just sit home, the reason you go to a church, the reason you go out to a a monument somewhere. The reason you go to a reading, an annual reading of some poet or philosopher's works, the reason you do it is to make you get up and to do something that requires your active participation to encourage your humanness, which is this. May I? Okay. Say contraire. Because the only way a practice of any sort becomes a tradition, the only way that it can ever be said to be now a tradition is you have a group of people, that is whoever part of the participants of the tradition, who now have forgotten they have no knowledge of why it was started, and now they will simply blindly do it. That is the definition of tradition. Another one, but it is equally as far as the other one. Now, you, at least you think I went too far. If we were talking about ordinary people and a tradition, and you ask somebody, and they say, yes, I am a faithful, whatever they said, Jew or Catholic or you know, follower of somebody or whatever, and you say, well, uh, what, you're, you have several good, many traditions. They go, yes, and you'd say, well, uh, you might pick out one you've heard, and you say, well, isn't the primary one so-and-so or the two big ones? They go, yeah, and they say, would you faithfully follow it? And they go, no, nah, I thought, I don't, I don't really agree with all that. Uh, we don't have time or it's not of any use to me to stay on that and keep shading it to degrees. But you understand, if they said that, yes, that they were a firm believer and a, an adherent to some idea, some teaching, some philosophy, some system, and that they will all have traditions, and you start questioning about some of the major traditions, they went, well, no. Now, that one I kept thinking about, I would... I've went over there several times when they were having it, and I looked, and I thought about it, and I, you know, I don't agree with that. And let's say it's the heart of their tradition. What if you're a Catholic, and you mention Mass? They go, well, I like everything except Mass. <laughs> and you go, yeah. you know, hey, you know, you're nuts. You can't call yourself a Catholic. And you say, well, I, 
I just can't agree with it. You understand? He said, the person could say, well, I've thought about it. In fact, I've got many papers. You want me to bring you the notes? I have been writing and reflecting on this. That he's saying he's analyzed the tradition and for some reason has come up with his own conclusion that it's not worthwhile to be followed or shouldn't be followed. Do you understand that alone? Now denies him his claim to being a part of the tradition. Well, the Pope would excommunicate somebody or whatever they call it. Would, you know, they say, well, you're not a Catholic. In other words, the only way that you can be part of a grand tradition, and remember the first one I gave, the tradition being when it's at the level at which we're referring, is to encourage one to more humanness, which is more reflection, more thought, more attempt to perceive the true nature of life. That's what traditions are for. Okay, we got that. But now I've got to point out to you that a tradition is not a tradition until its participants blindly follow it without having an idea why. Because if they don't, they're not part of the tradition. Would anyone like to play the game again, the rhetorical game of me asking, do you see how life is arranged? That I was, after all my roundabout talk, tradition, you would, would, would most likely, most usually come into play under a condition like this of talking about the kinds of traditions that in some way are claimed to be, assumed to be, part of the process to try and increase one's understanding of life, to increase one's consciousness, to uh, reach a state of the Buddhahood, the enlightenment, that sort of thing. Is that what the traditions are for? And look, and yet look, even under those conditions it would appear to be that you would always assume are extraordinary, that are non-routine. And all the descriptions, all the people's imagination to play along with it, their conception of it, uh, balances out the dance that you've got to play your own part. But you hear of traditions, and the traditions on the surface, the first time you hear of them, sound as though they are extraordinary enough that it almost represents a singular commitment to something out of the ordinary. In case you think I actually did change the subject since the first 30 minutes. To it, the first time that you ever heard that people, now it sounds familiar, but the first time you ever heard that people were interested in such as you were, you went, yeah, at some age, and it says, do you know what most of them do? No, what, what? You don't tell me. Well, in whatever book you found or whoever you're talking to, and they say, well, I read this book, and it said that most of them throughout the ages, the tradition has been, is you have to give up everything you own, your family and everybody, and you've got to find some real weird place on the other side of the world that's real inhospitable and cold, and they, you have to take off most of your clothes or wear some kind of old ratty robe around all the time, and you have to sit and not move like 20 hours a day. And then when you get up, they beat you with a stick, and you go to bed, and they let you sleep 30 minutes, and they throw hot porridge in your room. <laughs> and at first you hear about it, and it sounds so extraordinary that you think, well, that, that does fit a tradition because you never heard of it. And also, had you analyzed it in that way, you would have thought, well, it, that would be to encourage one out of, or to help stimulate one out of one's stupor. If you had by then had that kind of terminology, that it would at least give you the, it, the potential is to shake you out of your normal state of consciousness. There would be the kind of continuing, uh, wider encompassing hair shirt dynamic. That there you are around other people, and the whole thing is to kind of shake you up. And that's the tradition. And it all sounds great. Unless any of you heard why I was described or not, that contraire. A tradition only becomes a tradition. As always, or as most of the time, I have no asterisks, no manufacturer's warning, no disclaimers. Absolute. For a tradition to become a tradition, all of us in adherents, all of its followers must have now have no knowledge of its original purpose and must simply blindly follow it. Or it's not a tradition. If you've heard of it and it's traditional, it means that everyone involved, or that but no one involved now knows what the original purpose was. And they simply blindly follow it. Which is why I made up my example, but it may sound to ordinary ears, I'm sure it would sound debatable to start with, but just look at the example I made up of a man that would pick out one of the great traditions of whatever tradition he's pursuing and go, well, you know, this one I've thought about. I've sit around and I've wondered on this and I finally decided no. 
Well, the man is not a follower of it because you've got to blindly do it. Now, I know that ordinary mind, especially if they were speaking religiously, but ordinary minds would want to naysay that and argue it. Like, well, wait a minute. It's not blindly follow it. Yeah, it is. Like I said, no, nah, there have been thinkers in the Catholic Church. There have been thinkers in all religions. <laughs> well, if they're going to go that far, they could, say, you know, they could then try to put off on us that we've had people in politics, world leaders that talk. <laughs> you know, what do they think we are, idiots? Do we look that country? Hmm, well... The very thing that would seem to be, is the way I'm using tradition tonight, let's now take it to wrap it up in the mystical, the real extraordinary sense. Because everyone wants to know what to do to start with, and you hear that there are traditions of doing certain things. It is not a tradition. Not a tradition until everyone, until no one involved remembers, has any knowledge of the original purpose. No one involved understands the original purpose. They may have some written knowledge that, you know, yoga so-and-so said, well, do so-and-so because, but no one involved now has any understanding of what its purpose was to start with. That's one. And two, they simply blindly do it. Without those two things, it's not a tradition, even a mystical tradition. That is, even a, a tradition, let's put it this way, a tradition Describe it twofold, a whole new mystical tradition, or this whole new mystical system somewhere, that its purpose was to make one more intelligent and to make one capable of thoughtful, independent action. That's fair, okay? Got that. Now, I've described tradition as no tradition of any sort. It can be a mystical tradition without two things over here. One is that no one involved with it has any understanding of its purpose. <laughs> and two, they must blindly do it. <laughs> so there you are. The two things you needed or looking for in my necessity. It's like the very thing. It's the great thing about doing this is you finally... I guess we can end with a sort of a cartoon picture. I just, a new fable, new story. Yeah. God travels the world looking for a place that serves uh, jalapeno falafels. <laughs> we'll assume, I assume that you assume this will be a metaphor of some sort. <laughs> that the jalapeno Falafel represents something else. But he searches the whole world. All different cultures, all different places, of the, all, tries all sorts of food, samples here and there, and finally finds a place. I should have drug it out, but you know how it goes. I could drug it. Traveled here and there, went to warm climes, cold climes, went to places that says, oh, he'd say, I'm looking for a jalapeno falafel. And they go, oh, they said, come in, we've got falafels and we've got some Louisiana hot sauce. And he they tried, you know, so, yeah, no, not quite. Then went to places that said we got something better. Then they got some, no, wait a minute. We've heard of that. Uh, and we don't have them. But we have some that were the forefathers. I mean, they just call them now. I, I know where you got that. Where do you get that, I wonder? But I know what you mean by a jalapeno falafel. But no, no, no. That's just some kind of new age version of it. It's, we got, we got, before they called it that, we got the real one. So he tries them all. Was there sore enough? All over the world wears that two or three pairs of shoes and four pairs of feet. <laughs> About to get discouraged, it just seemed like he'll never find one. And suddenly, one day, I won't tell you where, he's patrolling down this small dark alley. He looks up and it's a shop, little sign, and the sign says, Jalapeno Falafels. <laughs> well, pff, need I tell you? And he opens the door and goes in, and, uh, see, and then. That's what I've been talking about all night. <laughs> he opens the door, and this is it. He opens the door, steps in, and it was worth the wait. I mean, I, that wasn't it. I just meant it was worth the wait of me bringing the story up to that point tonight. It just worked out. 
Well, I was going to end, so just bring on the accordion band. Let them fill out the last two minutes of the tape. <laughs> he opened the door. It said, jalapeno falafels. This is it. <sighs> After a lifetime, and he opens the door and steps in and... Bring up the uh, accordion music. I'm going to think on that. Was somebody by that?